Member Vivi here with you for the next hour, talking professional wrestling and mixed martial arts, something we do every single day here on the Sports Byline Broadcasting Network. And whether you're joining us via TuneIn or iHeart, American Forces Radio, SportsByline.com, over-the-air affiliates, Sirius XM 156, podcast or video streaming on Twitch or YouTube, however you're joining me, I just want to say thank you for spending a little bit of time with us today. I do that on behalf of El Jefe as well, too. The big boss man, Brian Alvarez, right now en route to Las Vegas, Nevada to begin all of the F4W Online slash Wrestling Observer convention festivities all taking place around Double or Nothing weekend. And if you're headed to Las Vegas this weekend, I definitely hope that everyone both arrives and departs safely. Ed in San Antonio, I'm looking at you when I say that. Although I, I think maybe I should be looking at the great Okan, who seems to be having all of the fun so far in, in Sin City, at least according to Will Ospreay's social media. Uh, he was getting whipped by a, a busty waitress at the Heart Attack Cafe. Uh, Okan was posing for pictures while having two handfuls of butt cheeks from two consenting topless ladies. There's a picture of him now riding a mechanical bull that doubles as a phallic symbol. It's, the great Ocon's having fun. He's got his hands in everything. Unfortunately, he didn't have his hands well enough on Trent Beretta when he claw slammed him through a table last night on Dynamite. And we'll get into that later on. It's a heavy AEW news day as we close in on Sunday's Double or Nothing pay-per-view. Today, Tony Khan held his pre-pay-per-view uh, media call. And I'll give you some of the notes and takeaways from that. Uh, including news on when Double or Nothing's main event will be starting. If you're an NBA fan first and a wrestling fan second, you're going to want to take note of this. And we also finally have a start time to the Go Home Rampage on Friday. It's going to be 6.30 leading into the NHL playoffs on TBS. Got the best of the Super Juniors, updates from NXT, and a whole lot more. Join me after the break, will you? Wrestling Observer Live. Um, Wrestling Observer Live. You can find it at WrestlingObserver.com. And we do this show for an hour at a time, but if you want us 24-7, best place you can try to find us on Twitter. I'm at SemperVivi. The timeline for this show is at WONF4W. The broadcaster is at Sports Byline USA. And if you love pro wrestling, at Mid-Atlantic Pod. If you're not following Brian Alvarez, you may want to do that too. Brian with a Y, at Brian Alvarez. I'm sure he's going to have all sorts of adventures posted up from this weekend during the F4W convention, the annual convention, now wrapped around Las Vegas, double or nothing weekend. Big activities taking place there. We actually have a, a time for one of the activities there on Friday, uh, TNT Network, Rampage, with the St. Louis Blues win over the Colorado Avalanche on Wednesday night. The final AEW TV show before Sunday's Double or Nothing will air in the United States at 6.30 p.m. Eastern Time. 3.30 p.m. on the West Coast with the NHL playoff festivities and pre-show kicking off at 7.30 leading into that game at 8. Brian Danielson will take on Matt Seidel in an effort to show his injured leg won't be a detriment going into Sunday's Anarchy in the Arena match. Uh, Danielson caught his leg between the stage and the ring after last week's Rampage main event and was a target of the Jericho Appreci Appreciation Society on uh, Wednesday's Dynamite. William Regal will also be on commentary for that match. Also, former AEW Tag Team Champions, the Young Bucks, will be in action ahead of their match with the Hardys on Sunday. And TNT Champion Scorpio Sky will be given a new custom-made title by Dan Lambert after his belt was destroyed by Sammy Guevara and Frankie Kazarian and Ty Conti last week. So those additions will join the Ruby Soho, Chris Statlander, Owen Hart Foundation Tournament semifinal match, which will see the winner moving on to face Britt Baker on Sunday. So... Lots of AEW news today as we as we lead into Sunday. Taking a break from the Red Bull Blueberry. We got a the summer edition here. The the apricot and, and strawberry. If you're an ASMR kid, get ready. There we go. Delicious. Now I'm ready and fired up for all this stuff. Tony Khan, I can never be 
as fired up as Tony Khan. Few people can. Tony Khan has a plan for the double or nothing main event. If Boston and Miami goes to a game seven on Sunday night. So Khan appeared on the AEW unrestricted podcast. And the text of this is up. Uh, Josh Nason posted it up at wrestlingobserver.com. Uh, Khan appeared on the AEW unrestricted podcast on Thursday and spoke about what he will do if the pay-per-view runs head to head with that game. Uh, the quote, if it were to go to a game seven, we have a contingency plan because first of all, we'll get started with the live pay-per-view broadcast, probably just before that game would tip off, but I don't care if it goes long, even if it went to overtime on planning ahead, Khan said on the show. He noted that he attended the Manny Pacquiao-Tim Bradley fight in 2012, which started so late as not to occur at the same time as the NBA Eastern Conference Finals that year. Coincidentally, that series was also between the Celtics and the Heat. Khan went on to say that he promises Hangman Page for CM Punk for the World Championship. They're not going to go into the ring until after Game 7, if there is a Game 7. So it leaves open, even for those diehard fans of those teams, if there's a Heat Celtics Game 7, same as 10 years ago. So the Celtics currently lead 3-2 with Game 6 taking place on Friday night. Conwin also went on to say that he promises, just like Bob Arum did, another promoter here in Vegas, that Pacquiao versus Bradley is not going to go into the ring. I promise we'll hold it back because we planned ahead in case there was a Game 7, not knowing who it would be. It's kind of crazy. It might not even happen, but if it does, we're prepared. Those were too many words all shoved in there to basically say that that match, the main event, is going into the ring uh, <laughs> after the, the basketball game, which... The thing with the Bradley-Pacquiao fight and at times where there's been a gentleman's agreement between promoters who are running in the same town to not run at the same time and to not have main events cross over or do any of that stuff is it was taking place in the same city. In this case, I don't know how much the crossover is. And obviously, look, we know there's a crossover because we see how the ratings are affected by the NBA playoffs in really the NBA regular season as well, but certainly in the playoffs. So it, it obviously it's going to matter. But to me, if you have paid 50 bucks, and this is just my opinion. To me, if a wrestling fan has already paid 50 bucks for the show, I don't think they're going to be switching over. And even if they are switching over, who cares? You know, to me, this is this is not like it's the Super Bowl. It's not like it's the NBA Finals. It's not even like it's, I, I don't know. I, I just, I, I find it to be overthinking maybe this a little bit here. You know, if this was a, a dynamite, if this was a live television show, a, a Clash of the Champions style of show, I, I may understand it a little bit more, but why there's so much concern over that for a pay-per-view I'm not sure, especially in the era of a DVR where you can just go back and rewind. I'm not sure why it matters all that much, but but he wanted to make sure that he got that news out there, that they are going to counter-program uh, the NBA. I hated when WWE did that with Raw and the NFL, uh, when they started uh, really taking a hit with their ratings and the, the NFL started roaring back a couple years ago. Remember, they sent John Cena out there to kind of filibuster for a while till the till halftime, and, and then they would do things during halftime. I just, I'm not a big proponent of that idea. Worry about what you're worrying about and everything else kind of be damned. You know, I, I just don't think that... Again, the people that are going to be ordering this show, uh, you know, I, I, I just don't see why it's that big of a deal. But he had a lot to say today during the media call. And a lot of this is up. In fact, all of this is up at WrestlingObserver.com. You can find audio uh, of that event up there right in the main page, right in the uh, news article posted by Josh Nason. Uh, and, and as part of the build to Double or Nothing, some of the things that he talked about, uh, that Tony Khan talked about, $1.1 million in ticket sales is what uh, he is estimating for the show. Uh, he didn't specifically commit 
to September's All Out coming from the Hoffman Estates Now Arena in Greater Chicago, Illinois. But he wants to keep the tradition of running in and around Chicago uh, for that pay-per-view uh, that weekend. He, he does want to do that. Uh, there's no update on ROH returning to weekly TV, but Khan said that he continues to have good talks with Warner Brothers and Discovery uh, about how to expand AEW. He'd like to get weekly TV and a return to pay-per-view for Ring of Honor going soon. He was also asked about MJF, including his contract status that MJF keeps bringing up in promos and on his social media. And Khan said that wrestling is more interesting when real life is included on screen and talked about free agency was such a big thing in the 90s. Uh, Guys jumping back and forth between Nitro and Raw. Although he didn't express anything specific about their negotiations or anything else. Um, just as an aside for me, I mean, the fact that people take this and run with it when MJF has got several years remaining on his contract is hilarious to me, but it also shows how good MJF is and the fact that, you know, hey, look, he seems to be getting under fans' <laughs> skins for real. You know, he gets the biggest reaction as a heel when he goes out there. It's not even close uh, from an AEW fan base that uh, I'm not saying they cheer everybody. I'm not saying it's like NXT, but... You know, those people, you know, they appreciate great talent, but even MJF can get them, get them to boo them. So, uh, cons thought it made sense for CM Punk to face top wrestlers when he started and not be rushing the AWA to, to the AEW world title scene. So he could work his way up. He said, Hangman pages road to the title was very familiar. He also made it sound like the Owen Hart tournament would be a yearly event. Fans are going to learn on Sunday what each tournament winner will receive. And he also said that ROH was bought by him personally and not under AEW due to circumstance, which is price and opportunity, and that he wants them to be their own standalone brand. And he's also looking forward to touring Canada as well. Got a couple of other notes coming out of this presser, as well as Dynamite's review from last night. All that and more when we get back. Wrestling Observer Live. Wrestling Observer, Wrestling Observer Live. Mike Semper Phoebe here with you, Brian. I'm Rez is on vacation. Producer Dom sending me wacky stories for minor league baseball. Savannah Bananas getting a kid out to play left field. Love this stuff. Toronto Angels game tonight. Probably going to be pretty big, too. No wrestling. Oh, well, I guess Impact's on tonight, so. But if you don't want to watch Impact, and you don't want to watch the New York Rangers continue on to, as their comeback against the Carolina Hurricanes continues, you know, there's there's plenty of other things. Tony Khan will still probably be talking about Double or Nothing uh, in some aspect somewhere. Uh, I'll wrap up uh, some of the stuff from his uh, presser that he had going on. Uh, Khan... Uh, just the, one of the couple of the last things here, uh, he was asked about his relationship with Warner Brothers Discovery post merger and assurances about the future of AEW and Khan said he got great feedback from the company and was quote honored and blessed that they are throwing AEW a party next week in Los Angeles post dynamite at the forum. He called it a big deal, incredibly reassuring and that some of the top executives and all of Warner Brothers discovery will be there. So that is going to be a big show, no matter what a, a again, running Southern California for the first time. The young bucks are back home. Scorpio skies back home. Christopher Daniels, Frankie Kazarian, all of Samoa Joe, all those people that, that they cut their teeth. I'm sure Rocky Romero is going to be there. I'm hoping for my own sake that a bunch of New Japan strong guys are going to be there, even let Shibata show up and kick somebody in the face. I would love to see that, although that that may be more of a pipe dream. But, you know, judging from this week's Dynamite, we're, we're going to get a little bit more New Japan action as we lead towards Forbidden Door. Khan also did mention something, and this came from Wednesday, that the media will now be able to record and stream the Double or Nothing scrum that will take place after the pay-per-view, reversing an earlier stance by AEW that had barred media from recording. Tony said he has seen some of the wrestling media are upset with our policy that they can't record the post-pay-per-view scrum on site at Double or Nothing this Sunday. No problem. We'll change it. You can record media. Be on the lookout for an email from AEWPR. See you tonight on AEW Dynamite. I have no idea why they decided to make that decision. And I, the, the scrums, I, I mean, for 
I, I don't know. I, maybe there are. I don't know of any scrums that seemingly take place anymore out in the public with with reporters that don't include, <laughs> you know, electronic recording. Uh, you know, it's not like it's the 50s and everybody's got their little notepad and their pen scribbling stuff down. So I don't know what caused them to make this decision. Uh, if you're if you're going to do something like that, why have a, a scrum at all? And I guess, he, you know, the pushback that he got, which, again, makes perfect sense coming from the media side. They've gone ahead and, and decided to flip that. So, you know, I, again, I don't know if that came up today during the presser as to why they, they had made that decision in the first place. But. Uh, all's well that ends well for the media as they're going to be able to record all that sort of stuff that takes place uh, after the main presser that's going to take place after the show. Sting is not going to be around, though, unfortunately. He's out of uh, this weekend's Fan Fest due to injury. AEW tweeted on Wednesday that Sting had not been cleared to travel due to an injury and that he would not be appearing at the Saturday, May 28th Fan Fest as scheduled. AEW says the fans purchased, who purchased meet-and-greet tickets for Sting will be contacted with refund information. Sting was attacked by members of the Undisputed Elite in a post-match melee on last week's Dynamite following an Adam Cole-Jeff Hardy match during an angle, which also included Kyle O'Reilly pilmanizing Sting's left leg with a chair so all the best to sting i don't know if this is storyline or not uh maybe he is a little bit banged up with what he's done <laughs> in some of the matches at his age and some of the the, the some of the heights that he's do dove from uh, i wouldn't be surprised if he is a little bit banged up gives him some time to have an excuse to be away from darby allen for a while so uh, the, all the best to him. If it's not storyline and he is banged up, all the best to the uh, to, to Sting. <coughs> As COVID is still a little bit stuck in my lungs. Uh, Champs Sports has announced that a sneaker collaboration, as the AEW news continues, uh, will be taking place between AEW and Diadora of all of, of all shoes. And I, I a little bit surprised by that. Uh, the, the shoes were released today. They went on sale at 10 a.m. Uh, they were released in honor of Pride Month. The AEW Diodora's uh, N9002s, available exclusively at Champs Sports and ChampsSports.com, retailing for $120. Champs also sent out a press release yesterday stating that they're going to be donating $25,000 to the Trevor Project, a suicide prevention and crisis intervention group for LGBTQ plus young people. The Diodoras, and they were, if the, the, the picture is up on AEW social media, they are sharp, sharp looking. They, they are black shoes, uh, nylon and suede. Uh, the, the overlay uh, of the AEW logo and the Diodora logo on the side of the shoe is rainbowed out and shiny. So they really do look very, very sharp. Uh, type of shoes that'll go with everything. Uh, the And this is interesting to me because with everything going on, we've heard about the video game and Kenny Omega and all that sort of stuff, but I didn't realize that they were so heavy into uh, this game with Diodora. You know, obviously there was a, the stuff with AJ Francis and the Young Bucks talking about bootleg Nikes and Jordans and all that sort of stuff. Uh, but AEW is, is really into the footwear game here as there's going to be four additional AEW releases this year. There's going to be one with the Young Bucks, and then the next three are going to be a part of the HHM umbrella, as the press release states. Andrade, Lucha Brothers, and Santana and Ortiz are all going to get releases in the fall to celebrate Hispanic Heritage Month. So that's pretty cool. And again, that's not something I realized that they were into, Fulham, I thought maybe, okay, maybe the relationship with Diodora came through something with the, the connections with the cons over in the Premier League and over in the Champions League. That's not the case. They, they have Adidas kits. So I'm not sure where the relationship started, but AEW getting into that game uh, with a, a major manufacturer, obviously a lot bigger in, in, in Italy, a lot bigger in Europe, and, and big in certain scenes, including soccer, obviously, but... Uh, an interesting, an interesting collaboration there. And again, $120, you know, those types of pre, you know, deals that they, they usually happen sell out pretty quick.
quick. You know, somebody that, that likes to collect Adidas, you know, shoes when I can afford to, you know, and, and I don't even bother when it comes to Jordans and that whole deal with the, the sneakers app. It's almost impossible. So I don't know if those shoes are still out there or not. Go to champsports.com and you can see if they are. Change gears here a little bit. That's enough AEW news for right now. Sad news for fans of of Nikita Lyons. She has suffered a partial MCL tear and sprain. Uh, But there is a little bit of good news here. Uh, Lyons on her Instagram Live said that the injury will not require surgery and that she's already begun a rehabilitation uh, on the knee. Uh, She had been set to take on Fallon Henley in a semifinal match on this past week's NXT 2.0, but was replaced in the match by Trifany Stratton. Stratton defeated Henley and will now go on to face the former Roxy, Roxanne Perez, in the finals of the breakout tournament. Lyons signed with WWE in 2021 after being offered a contract at the WWE tryout event held over SummerSlam weekend in Las Vegas. She had previously wrestled for the WOW promotion in 2018 and 19 and then made her debut uh, on 205 Live, which I didn't even realize, on the December 31st, 2021 edition uh, towards the, the the dead end of that show. Uh, her NXT 2.0 debut came on February 22nd, and her feud with the Last Legend has inspired millions upon millions across the world. Speaking of NXT 2.0, ratings were down. No surprise, NBA and NHL playoffs. Tuesday's show did 551,000 viewers on the USA Network, down 8.3% from last week. Ties the second lowest audience for the show since February 15th. But in the 18 for 49, 18 to 49 demo, which uh, was terrible as far as numbers go, it was 43rd on the cable charts, a 0.13 rating and down 7.1% from last week. The reality is NXT, even though they're down over 20% year to year, they are still solid in that demo, 18 to 49. They're holding steady. So, you know, <laughs> what can you say? Uh, women have dropped, as Dave Meltzer noted on this morning's Wrestling Observer Radio that he did with Brian that is available for subscribers over at WrestlingObserver.com. The women's audience has just completely collapsed. The men's 50 audience is, as we talk about every week on this show, the over 50 audience, but especially the men's side of that, is still doing very, very well for them, so... There you go. If we get the information on last night's uh, Dynamite show, we'll give that to you before we go off the air. Coming up next segment, I will run down all of the news coming out of Dynamite from last night. I thought it was a, a pretty good show. Uh, in fact, I thought it was a really good show. There were a couple of down moments uh, during it, but nothing that was too crazy at all. Uh, but we'll get into that uh, once we come back from break. Uh, before we go to this break, though, uh, DDT will mention this. Uh, one of the first promotions in Japan to announce that they are allowing fans to cheer and boo beginning with their July 7th show. The seating will still be distanced, and the show is going to be called Let Your Voices Be Heard. So will this uh, knock down the door for Noah and New Japan and everybody else? We shall see. We'll be back. Wrestling Observer Live. Network. Hopefully I'm not going to choke out anymore here. <laughs> Again, this COVID is not fun. Still got the shallow breathing and all that, but we're going to make it. Going to make it. Going to survive because that's what I do here. You know what has not survived, though, before I get to this AEW Dynamite review from last night? What has not survived is WWE running Las Vegas at Allegiant Stadium, where we just saw Cody Rhodes not all that long ago do a promo on uh, <laughs> on Raw and on SmackDown uh, in an email sent to those who had purchased tickets for the show, WWE has announced on Thursday that Money in the Bank is being moved to the MGM Grand Garden Arena in Las Vegas. The pay-per-view was originally scheduled to be held at the larger Allegiant Stadium, which is home of the Las Vegas Raiders. Money in the Bank is taking place on Saturday, July 2nd. UFC 276 is also being held in Las Vegas that night and being headlined by a middleweight title fight between Israel Adesanya and Jared Cannonier. So see, we did talk about mixed martial arts here today in the program. Those who had already purchased tickets to Money in the Bank will be automatically refunded. An exclusive pre-sale for those ticket holders will begin at 10 a.m. Pacific time on Wednesday, June 1st. 
This would have been the first Money in the Bank pay-per-view to be held in a stadium. Dave Meltzer reported that 16,833 tickets had been distributed for Money in the Bank as of May 6th. Andrew Zarian of the Matt Men Podcast and also your humble host of this very show every Sunday at 6 p.m., uh, reported that last month or reported last month that WWE's goal in running more stadium shows was not necessarily to sell them out, but it would allow them to draw crowds in the twenty thousand to thirty five thousand dollar or thirty five thousand person range and of course add some stadium pricing into that as well too. Allegiant Stadium has a listed capacity of sixty five thousand. The MGM Grand Garden Arena has a capacity of seventeen thousand, so that's the way it goes for that one. The next event that is looking to take place in the stadium or will be taking place in the stadium unless something changes, SummerSlam at Nissan Stadium in Nashville on July 30th. And then, of course, coming up in September 3rd, Cardiff, Wales, where we may be seeing Roman Reigns against Drew McIntyre or possibly Drew McIntyre against uh, uh, Tyson Fury. So... Interesting move uh, by WWE, but then again, you know, even though there's a lot of creative camera work that you can do, less than 17,000 people inside of a football stadium, I mean, go back and look at those world-class Parade of Champion shows, not the first one where, where Kerry Von Erich defeated Ric Flair in 84, but like, you start seeing shows after that, and it's just, it gets pathetic, and you know, 17,000 people paying good money yeah, it's a pretty good windfall, but it's the optics. It's just how it looks inside that 60,000-seat stadium. And it's, you know, I went to a Great American Bash in Washington, D.C. There's another, I'm an old man, so there's another great example of it at RFK Stadium. And they just, they didn't really draw flies there. I mean, they could have had it at the Cap Center. They could have had it anywhere else and actually made more money than running out that building and then not <laughs> not drawing it all in it, but... So there you go, and that, that news is up there, WrestlingObserver.com, up on the website right now. Surely Dave is going to have more information coming up on that in this week's Wrestling Observer newsletter, which is a part of your subscription that you can get for twelve ninety nine a month. Just go to WrestlingObserver.com for the details there. And now we shall get to AEW Dynamite from Wednesday night, the Michelob Ultra Arena, where they will also be for Rampage coming up this Friday. This was once known as the Mandalay Bay Event Center. In case you're wondering, okay, where the hell is the Michelob Ultra Arena? It's at Mandalay Bay. The show opened up, and boy, this was good. This was a great uh, they had a really good first half hour of this show. I can tell you that opened up with the cage match between Sean Spears and Wardlow. First person we see is MJF, who of course is a special referee. He was wearing a tribute to Shawn Michaels referee outfit from the attitude era, complete with extra tight sleeveless referee shirt and extra, extra tight black tight shorts all while doing the the bill alfonso i'm going to call it right down the middle daddy hand motion as he came down to the ring wardlow was then escorted to the ring by security he's in handcuffs which mjf was responsible for taking off but damned his thing he lost the key so as he's searching around for the key spears attacks wardlow and then MJF joins in. And for those of you who have been under a rock, one of the stipulations throughout this feud between Wardlow and MJF is if Wardlow puts his hands on MJF, he loses out on the match on Sunday and his career is pretty much screwed because he will always be under the employ uh, of MJF and, and has no way of getting out of that contract. So both guys kick the crap out of him for a while until Wardlow is able to backdrop Spears and kick him away. When he does, MJF gets in his face, starts heckling him, and then eventually spits on him, which causes Wardlow to hulk up. And when he does, he rips the cuffs off. And we've seen this a lot in wrestling, strongman type of routines, but sometimes they come across really hokey and corny. Even with the best of guys, it can come across as, as hokey and corny when you're doing something like this. This could not have come across any better. This feud, with few, few exceptions, and there have been some times where they, they've done a little bit of misfiring. For the most part, though, 99% of this thing, in my opinion, has been absolutely awesome. Long story short, 
The cage door opens up. Spears goes out to grab a chair. He comes back in with it. MJF is holding Wardlow. Spears swings the chair, and of course, Wardlow moves. He cracks MJ up over that with a chair, which, if the chair was not gimmicked, Max, don't do that, or you're never going to get to WWE. You're never going to get to 2024. <laughs> it's just ye. Your neck, your head, you don't need to be doing this anymore. They're, get your hands up. And unfortunately, he was not able to do that. Spears brained him. MJF is out cold. He's laid out spread eagle. We get the visual of Wardlow rising up from behind Spears, who knew he knows he messes up. Delivers the powerbomb symphony. The last one onto a chair. Bryce Remsburg ran down to the ring, threw the open door, counted the pin. Wardlow wins, so his match with MJF for Sunday is on. About 50 security guards then run in the ring. Wardlow kills all of them, including powerbombing a guy against the cage. The guy falls as the cage wobbles back from the ring. The guy falls, and unfortunately for him, his entire body fell between the cage and the ring, except for his left leg, which was bent up before that disappeared. Wardlow just walks away. Ends up, as all this is going on, MJF escapes. He's on the ramp. And like King Kong, Wardlow then goes and ascends to the top of the cage, looks down on everybody. It was awesome. The fans were going nuts from the start of that thing. I thought it was great. Chris Jericho and the Appreciation Society were backstage. Daniel Garcia, as they were walking, he's cutting a promo about how violent sports entertainers can be. They see a stagehand backstage wearing a John Moxley shirt, so they start to bully him before Jericho... Just throws a fireball at him because he's a wizard. The guy's rolling around on the floor. Nobody runs in to help. Nobody said Jim Ross is going nuts. He can't believe it. The guy's rolling around making noises. The, the people are just getting civilians are getting fire thrown in their faces and nobody's freaking out about this. But instead, he and Excalibur then had to run down what was coming up next on the show. So. Uh, again, a little a little wonky there. Uh, next up was the face-off between CM Punk and Adam Page. The response to this has been somewhat polarizing. And, I, you know, again, I won't run down every little detail about this thing. Uh, basically, it comes down to a matter of respect and the lack of respect that Adam Page has for CM Punk. And CM Punk being really shocked that Adam Page is making everything so personal. And it gets down to, to Page saying he loves this place. And that he is going to be defending AEW, not just the title against Punk, but also defending the locker room against Punk. He's going to beat Punk for everybody in the locker room. He hates everything that Punk brings to the table. And Punk says he doesn't understand why Paige is so angry. He's not making it personal. It's about business. And he says the, the road that Paige uh, is driving right now is paved by him. The building in AEW that he built was off his lumber. And the blueprint for everything came from guys like him. And he demanded that Adam Page shake his hand and that Page was only upset with himself and Page said no and he started getting upset and, and, and Punk stuck his hand right in Page's chest Page hit him in the face knocked him down He Page storms off and Punk is sitting there smiling, holding his face knowing that he got in the head of Hangman Adam Page and I, I thought this was good but I do wonder if they did a good enough job giving you a picture into Paige's mind as to why he recoils at Punk's presence and what Punk stands for. You know, I don't know if they've made it crystal clear as to why Punk doesn't res why Paige doesn't respect Punk, why the locker room doesn't respect Punk, why he feels Punk is being disingenuous about everything. If you know the story of CM Punk and how obstreperous he can be and how he can rub some people wrong. You get it, you know, and Paige has always been shown to be an a, emotional guy, an introspective guy, and a guy that is also incredibly intelligent, as JR always points out, talks about him uh, graduating early from Virginia Tech, but... I don't know if they made it clear about what Paige's mindset was and, and, and him being cerebral and, and his, you know, thoughts as to making them clear as to why he really doesn't like CM Punk. Uh, John Moxley and Eddie Kingston defeated Private Party. And then uh, Chris Jericho, who just 
comes out with Jericho Appreciation Society. Security didn't get to him. The police didn't come attacking him. Uh, no ambulance chasing lawyers uh, decided to run up on him for the, the guy he burned in the face. He just sat there alongside the other announcers and William Regal and did commentary on this match, uh, which, uh, of course, Kingston and, and Moxley ended up winning. After the match, the Jericho Appreciation Society ran down. Uh, and then Santino Ortiz and Brian Danielson did to even the odds. Uh, officials ran down to break everything up. Biggest key coming from this as they exited, though, was Danielson selling his leg and showing weakness going into that anarchy in the arena battle on Sunday and his match coming up on Friday as well. FTR defended the ROH titles against Rapongi Vice. Good match. I'd like to see it again, and I think we will. Why? Because we got no finish. For one of the few times, maybe the first time in AEW history, out came Jeff Cobb and the great Okan from New Japan Pro Wrestling, who slid into the ring and laid waste to everybody. And so the match got thrown out. It's a double disqualification. It's a no contest, a very rare thing to happen. And Cobb and the great Okan laid everybody out afterwards. So... Their presence, they're going after the IWGP World Tag Team Championships, which Rapongi Vice has talked about wanting to uh, to take. FTR, I'm sure, would love to add that belt to their collection as well, too. So it looks like we will be coming down to uh, some matches between the three of those teams and maybe some others thrown in there as well, too. Three-way between Swerve Stick, Strickland, Ricky Starks, and Jungle Boy. If you're going to watch one match from this show... It's either this or the main event with Kyle O'Reilly and Samoa Joe. Both were very, very good in their own way. Ricky Starks is fantastic at a lot of little things that other people can't do. Making the right face at the right time, reacting to things at the right time, making things look like a struggle and real and not a botch. He's just so very good at what he does. And I thought that was an excellent match. And I'm far more excited now watching the tag match than I was coming into that show last night. Uh, Tony Schiavone had an interview with Thunder Rosa, which for once, Tony Schiavone didn't get interrupted. He didn't get insulted. And Thunder Rosa didn't get beaten up during it. In fact, she actually cut her best promo that she's done while in AEW on Serena Deeb. I thought that was excellent. That match, which suffered, I thought, last week with Serena Deeb cutting that terrible promo, has redeemed itself a little bit. I look forward to their work in the ring. Going to get into what happened on the rest of the show when we get back from break. Wrestling Observer Live. Live. Sports Byline Broadcasting Network. Producer Dom. I want to thank him. I want to thank Producer Jared on video as well, too. So, the Dynamite Show. What did I leave out here? Owen Hart Cup Women's Semifinal. That's what I left out. Dr. Britt Baker defeated Tony Storm. Jamie Hayter came down uh, after being in the back, and it looked like she was going to come out and turn on Britt Baker. That was not the case. Is uh, I'm not sure if she was supposed to help Baker win by pushing the rope towards her. I think that's what it was, and things got thrown off a little bit, but it was a swerve. As uh, Jamie Hayter does not turn on Britt Baker, as a lot of people were expecting, and does not help Tony Storm win. Another thing that a lot of people were expecting is something that I was kind of hoping for. I have, I keep having a feeling that this thing was going to come down to Adam Cole and to Britt Baker, and I didn't like that idea <laughs> at all. I kind of wanted to see Tony Storm. I think she could have absolutely used it, and I think she would have been a a good first winner of this tournament with the international experience, the, the stardom experience, all that stuff. I, I thought it would have been Samoa Joe and Adam Cole. It was something that was teased on NXT when Joe co uh, choked out Adam Cole, when he was going after Kyle O'Reilly last year uh, before everybody ended up getting released. Um, so, but the Joe match with O'Reilly was a banger again. It, you know, probably went about, I'm not sure how long it went. Maybe it was about 12 minutes or so, but it was a really, really good match. And I, you know, it was finals worthy. That is for sure. Samoa Joe gets the victory. We'll go on to face Adam Cole. Man, struggle here on this show today, unfortunately for me. You're still shaking off the COVID. A lot to get into tomorrow as well. Got WWE SmackDown coming up, as well as the New Japan Best of the Super Juniors Tournament, which we will get into a little bit heavier. I've seen every match. We won't go through them all, but I'll tell you what I think about some of the best ones. I want to thank all of you for joining me today. Safe travels to Las Vegas. Be safe wherever you are. Hug your kids. Be good people. And we shall talk to you again after a while. <laughs>